Welcome to this special edition of Moving Hawaii Forward. I'm your host, Tim Apicella. In about a month from now, the state legislature will come together in a special session to decide how to best fill up the $3 billion deep hole for the Honolulu Rail Project. It still remains to be seen what tax funding strategy will be chosen, if any at all. No matter what path is chosen to come up with a $3 billion, hold on to your wallets. Thanks to the persistent efforts of outspoken critics of this rail project from the very start, the voices of Randy Roth, voices of Cliff Slater, voices of Panos Prepadoras, voices of Governor Ben Canetano and Scott Wilson, all voices either printed in newspaper editorials or spoken on TV, radio, or internet interviews, tried to warn all of us of this place we now find ourselves in. Only now the state legislators, certain council members, and the public are hearing their warnings, their voices, their stand against truth to power. With me today is one of those clear and strong voices who has ta taken a steadfast position to talk to anyone who's willing to listen. Our guest, Randy Roth, who is a recently retired law professor of the University of Hawaii, Manoa, tax attorney, and author of two important publications, The Price of Paradise and Broken Trust. Mr. Roth has spent years of his time and resources to shine a light upon Mayor's bold and broken promises of 10,000 new jobs for locals, or Hart's hyperbolic rail ridership projections of 116,000 trips per day, or the recent claims of rail stations that will be desirable centers for affordable housing. Most recently, Mr. Roth attended a city council committee meeting to testify and debate that the tax funding strategy of choice, the general excise tax, is a regressive tax, is a tax hardship on those who can least afford it, the poor and middle class of this island. Today we examine the tax alternatives of the legislature we'll look at and Hart's ridership numbers. Randy, thank you very much for coming on the show. I know you're getting ready to go on vacation, so spending time here before that is very much appreciated and you share your time and your thoughts with us. My pleasure. Thank you. You know, um, in the introduction I said you've, you've spent a lot of time and a lot of resources. You had a full-time job being a professor and all the other activities that you, that, you, that you do. How did you have time for all this and what keeps you motivated? Uh, I got a call from Cliff Slater one day asking if I would get involved in, in a lawsuit that he was contemplating in an attempt to stop rail. And I was opposed to rail, but I hadn't really done anything out of the ordinary in trying to um, help people understand it or to oppose it. And uh, I remember him saying, oh, it won't take much of your time. <laughs> 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 well, <laughs> many, many, many thousands of, of hours ago. Um, what, what motivates me, uh, and it motivated me on what some people call the, the Bishop Estate controversy of the late 1990s that the book Broken Trust is about, and it's motivated me on a number of other things that I've done during my life, is that I really expect our elected and appointed officials uh, to at least be honest with us. Uh, I can disagree on whether rail is good or bad, whether heavy rail is better or worse than light rail, those sorts of things, but when it becomes clear to me that people who are representing us in these powerful positions. When it becomes clear to me that they are intentionally misleading the public, that gets my juices going and that's the answer to your question on rail is once I figured out that this was intentional deception mm -hmm. uh, on the effect on traffic congestion, uh, on the effect on energy use, uh, you go down the long list and um, so that's what keeps me going. Well, it's interesting because in the previous show I, I used the term voice in the wilderness. Does it feel like you've been out there, you and Cliff Slater and Panos Prevadoras and Governor Cayetano, been out there as a minority voice and although you've gotten a lot of newsprint editorials and things like that, it just seems like you're up against a gargantuan concrete wall. We've had our names out there because we've written a lot of things that have, have appeared in the newspaper and, and, and elsewhere. but especially recently, I've become aware there's just a tremendous number of people out there who are very upset about rail. Some of them were for it from the beginning, but they don't like the way it's been done, and many of them have been against it from the beginning. 
And I, I got to be fully aware of that recently. When I retired, I decided I would get involved with Facebook. Mm -hmm. And so I did my first post, which was a three-minute video of me giving testimony against rail at the city council meeting. And the darn thing went viral. Um, it's been viewed 47,000 times. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> and there have been- Your first post? My first post. <laughs> and Wonderful. there were countless comments, and I've read every single one. And some of them are mean-spirited, and some of them use bad language, but the vast majority, uh, these are people who are paying attention, who really care, overwhelmingly are opposed to rail at this point in time, and it's made me feel less, uh, less as though those of us who've had our name in, in print, uh, less that we're out there voices in the wilderness and more we've just been the ones who've had a higher profile. But there are a lot of people who are following this closely who are very upset about That's good. how it's going. That's good. And I think finally it's filtering to our legislators. I think so. Um, very slowly, but it's getting there. Yeah. Um, Cliff Slater, Panos Prevederos, and I, I uh, have met with some uh, members of the legislature, and slowly but surely, they're they're getting it, and I'm you know hopeful, mm -hmm. almost uh, almost guardedly optimistic, but I'm hopeful that if and when they come into special session, uh, they will look at the issues um, with their eyes wide open, Great. Uh, telling themselves you know this is a city project and the city has an ability to raise the funds it says it needs. It's got a variety of alternatives that it could do and not need any additional money. If the legislature says, look, if, if they think taking heavy rail all the way to Ala Moana is worth doing, then let's let them raise taxes. Why would the legislature get involved in, in doing that? And especially what is resonating with legislators that we've been talking to is the city has made no effort to try to figure out what's gone wrong thus far. It's six years behind schedule. The estimated cost is virtually doubled. And the Hart Board and the City Council and the Mayor don't know why it's out of control, why everything's gone so wrong. And I went to a Hart Board meeting several weeks ago, first one I'd ever attended, and my jaw dropped into my lap when one of the board members actually said, we don't want to muck around in the past, saw that quote. right? Why, why, why look at what went wrong? We just want to look forward. And I thought, my goodness, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And then two seconds later, another board member chimed in. He said, yeah, and maybe what we would find is that we've already fixed whatever it was that went wrong. Now, this is the heart board whose primary job is to provide oversight, and they're saying, we don't want to see what's going on. Don't look behind this curtain. <laughs> you know, and to take the old Einstein quote and bend it a, a little bit, if you don't figure out what you've been screwing up so far, you're going to continue to screw it I up. saw those quotes, actually, uh, in the, the other day. And if I may, okay. um, I'd like to quote it directly. This was from Amber Shin, I believe. And uh, it was quoted, it's not my intent to muck around in the past and try to figure out what we did wrong in the past. I'm just trying to get forward. And I, I saw that quote. And, uh, <laughs> she said, we may have made some screwy, stupid mistakes. Yeah, that's here too. But, but that's in the past. <laughs> well, I memorized her lines. You could, if you were writing a farce, you couldn't could, have come up with something. This, no. And, and we're, not, you know, we're not dealing with a few million. We're dealing with 10 billion. And it, that's why it's not funny. I, I, <laughs> Some I, farcicals are funny. I try to laugh occasionally, <laughs> otherwise I'll just be crying all the time. It, um, especially now that the council has authorized the issuance of general obligation bonds, only 350 million right now, but the director of finance was there testifying and they expect it to go up to $2 billion. This is a mortgage on our kids' and grandkids' future. Um, so it's, it's wrong, yeah. and, and it would be wrong for us who, who recognize that it's wrong for us not to be doing something. And I think we're at a tipping point. Yeah, I really I do. It, I feel I it when I talk to legislators. Um, certainly I feel it when I read the comments on that, that Facebook post I was telling you about. I think we're at a tipping point. And once we hit it, things are going to change quickly, and someday people are going to look back 
and they're just going to marvel at how this rail fiasco could go on so long and it be so obvious that it makes no sense whatsoever. It'll be good that we will have turned it around, but people will marvel at how long it took. You know, um, there was a meeting on Friday from the uh, Honolulu uh, Transit Task Force, or, or Salvage the Rail, and one of the clear messages that they left on my mind was, if we stop at Meadow Street, I mean, at Meadow Street, it's not too late to fix it, you know, to do something different mm -hmm. that's going to cost a lot less money, uh, less time, and do something that will re won't regret you know, down the line. So that was a big message on their I, part. You know, I attended that same program. I, I thought they did a, an excellent job of presenting their idea. Uh, I've been influenced by Panos Prevederis to where um, I don't think that's the best of the options that are available. But clearly, that's something that the city has as an alternative where it could complete a rail system that goes, you know, through the, the city, including to, to Manoa they could do basically the route they're talking about now and come in under budget on the monies that have already been provided for without any new tax increase. And I thought they presented it well. Pano says an even better alternative involves using the guideway that's been built, you know, extending it a little bit further, mm -hmm. but, you know, to, to Middle Street, but using it for, for specially designed buses, and he's gone through all that the fit numbers. into those tracks. Oh, yeah. It, it, it's yeah. like if you're in a car wash. Right. You're <laughs> only, not going anywhere. Only it's going to be going 60 <laughs> miles an hour. So, um, Panos, uh, because of his credentials and just his, 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 his personal gravitas on, on anything having to do with transportation, I'm convinced that's a much better uh, alternative. But there are additional ones. Um, there was an article in Civil Beat, John Kawamoto wrote an article that said, you know, nobody wants to tear down that guideway, but we could use it the way some other cities have used that sort of space uh, for a bikeway, for a walkway, and you could have solar panels, you know, to right. shade people. It could be a, a real tourist attraction. Nobody would ever set out to spend billions of dollars to end up Yeah, with I would that. be one that would say, hmm. <laughs> but, but that's not the question. Yeah. It isn't, do we start from scratch? It's what the heck are we going to do with that guideway if we stop heavy rail? And my point is that whether it's the group you mentioned on Friday, it's Panos, or it's John Kawamoto, or there are several other possibilities, the city has some options, one of which is to do what it seemingly wants to do, which is plan A, full speed ahead, heavy rail, all the way to all one which I think makes no sense whatsoever. But if that's what they want to do, let them raise the money on their own. Legislature, stay out of it. Or if the legislature wants to get involved, say, first you figure out what's gone wrong so far. You figure out why this is out of control. And then we'll think about raising taxes some more. Right. Well, we're going to go to break here pretty soon. But one of the things that I think that the city and heart and, and the supporters of rail just can't get off and they use it as a primary uh, argument that we shouldn't touch it at all is, is the FTA, the Federal Transit Administration and the $1.55 billion they've committed to the project. We've received maybe $600 million and so the, the rest of the money has not been allocated. But they seem to be using that as an, an argument that just can't be tampered with. And when we get back from the break, I'm going to dive into that a little bit and figure out why that argument is really kind of a fallacy. So, and it is. And it is. <laughs> there we go. I'm Tim Apicell. I'm here with Randy Roth, and we're going to take a commercial break, and we'll be right back. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion. Nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we can find a way. There's got to be solution. How to make a brighter day. What do we do? We've got to give a little love, have a little hope. Make this world a little better. Try a little more, more than ever before. Welcome to Sister Power. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, where we motivate, educate, empower, and inspire all women. We are live here every other Thursday at 4 p.m. and we welcome you to join us here at Sister Power. Aloha and thank you. Hi, I'm Tim Apicello. This is Moving Hawaii Forward. Welcome back. I'm here with Randy Roth 
and we're talking about rail, potential rail funding here that's going to be coming up in a special session. And we're going to talk about right now is about FTA and the argument that they use why we can't, we can't divert from any other plan um, on this rail project. And you wrote um, an op-ed for Honolulu Civil Beat back on October the 10th, 2016. And the title of it, and I love the, I love the title, Pay FTA Back? Question mark. We should not pay a penny. I love the title. <laughs> um, and in there it says, FTA failed miserably to provide oversight for the rail project. That makes it complicit, not just morally, but legally. And I think the gist that you were getting to is that if all the critics that say we can't touch the real project, it has to go as is, or else we're going to have to pay all this money back, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think your point is maybe we don't have to pay it back. I, I think that's right. It's, as you said, $1.55 billion. Approximately half has been delivered to us already, and another half hasn't been, roughly speaking. Um, as the article addresses, um, the half that we've already received, I just don't see any way in the world that the federal government is ever going to have to, is ever going to come after that and say pay it back because the record is real clear. Our federal lawsuit that didn't stop rail, because of the discovery that you're able to do when you get involved in litigation like that, we have email within the FTA back 10 years ago when they had a statutory responsibility to provide oversight to the city on rail and they're emailing each other saying these guys don't know what they're doing they're saying these guys are being very dishonest you know they've got false statements and you know on and on and on well, let me go through a couple of those quotes i'll okay. interrupt you here because some of the quotes i find jaw dropping uh, i love this quote um, it's about their culture it's about heart culture and the culture of this this real project um, they never have enough time to do it right but lots of time to do it over. I mean, that's, I mean, they have this, as you said, a statutory a fiduciary responsibility to oversight on this project, and yet these emails are indicating that this thing's off track from the very beginning. Yeah, I, I think they got some political pressure from our senior senator at the time, who was the chair of the money committee in, in the Senate, and um, not that it matters anymore, but in making sense out of why the FTA would sit on their hands knowing that the folks in Honolulu didn't know what they were doing on the rail project and weren't being honest mm -hmm. with the public. <clears throat> the only explanation that makes sense to me, because these are professionals at the yeah, FDA, they, are. But they know where their budget but, comes from. Yeah. So I, I think it was basically political pressure that they were succumbing to. Regardless of the reason, they failed miserably in fulfilling their oversight responsibility. So the chances of them coming back now and saying, give us that money that was given to you during that period of time, I think are, are yeah, basically that's nil. Interesting. The half that we haven't gotten yet, number one, as this you know, estimated cost goes higher and higher and higher and is $10 billion now, panel says you're looking at least $13 billion to all in one. Whatever it's going to be, the percentage that the federal money consists of that total amount is getting smaller and smaller. But what's going to happen on the half that we haven't received no matter what we do at this end, that's a total wild card. You just can't predict. Once the Trump administration has their FTA administrator in place, uh, all I can say for sure on the politics is that they're not going to feel a whole lot of aloha for us on a political level. Yeah, I wonder why. <laughs> you know, I, I personally, I don't like politics yeah. and the thought of whether it's the Republicans doing it to the Democrats or vice versa. I just don't like the thought of as a practical matter, it's a reality. the FTA administrator appointed by Trump is not going to go out of his or her way to help the folks in Hawaii. Maybe the opposite. But in any event, this is such an unusual situation that nobody can predict what they're going to do regardless of whether we do the city's plan A or we do some other mm -hmm. approach to dealing with this situation that we have now where we've got some options but none of them are really very attractive. Right. Well, it is interesting that when um, New Jersey Governor um, Chris Christie uh, decided to cancel their big tunnel project, uh, the FTA actually settled on about a third of what was owed to them yeah. for a lot less. And, and they had no complicity there whatsoever. Exactly. They had done absolutely nothing wrong. They had just to the T, they had done what they were supposed to do, and they settled quickly for 30 cents on the dollar. I mean, if that and that alone should be over spoken right away as soon as we hear, oh, we can't do anything because of FTA, you know, da-da-da-da-da-da. 
we should be saying, well, you know, gee, it's funny that FTA with no no issues at all settled for a third less. Yeah. And so. And and frankly, and and I can't predict how other people are going to to behave, but I would bet the farm, as we say in Kansas, when we feel pretty <laughs> sure about something, I would bet the farm that the city's approach on all of this would not change one bit, even if the Fed said you're not going to get another penny. Mayor Caldwell, I think for political reasons, who knows why? I don't, I don't want to question mm -hmm. motivation. The, motive, the, the fact of the matter is everything from his actions thus far suggests that if the legislature gives him anything else, he's just going to go full speed ahead. If they have to live off of borrowed money for you know the next year or so, and if they have to raise property taxes after that in order to keep going, that and that alone is going to get them to look seriously at these other, other options. options. And once they look seriously at those other options, especially if the public hits that tipping point and lets its feelings be known by mm -hmm. members of the city council and, and whatnot, uh, I really think the city will eventually decide to do something other than its plan A, but it's got to be forced into that. Right. <laughs> if the legislature just gives them more tax money. It's just like giving drugs to somebody who's addicted. And they're going to keep on going. They're just enabling yeah. it. Well, it's, that's the genius of how this whole thing was set into play, because uh, a general excise tax is that slow boil that you just don't realize it's occurring. As the term's been, it's been baked into everything. It, it, and it's genius. It, I mean, that's, if that's how you're going to fund this, and no one really feels the pain directly, but maybe indirectly they feel it, that's the genius of a get. Everybody, when you say general excise tax, they say, oh, the half percent for the rail, that's only a half penny for the dollar I'm spending at the cash register. It just doesn't sound like, like mm -hmm. much at all. But if every time you bought something, a good or a service in Hawaii, in addition to the 4.71 percent that gets stated on many transactions, if in addition, if we were told, oh, by the way, this item that you're buying is X dollars more because of this business tax. Right. See, that's the other thing. You and I don't fill out, as consumers, we don't fill out an excise tax return because it literally is a business tax. It is a tax on the gross receipts, on the sale of goods and services in Hawaii. So some of that gets passed at the point of sale to the consumer, but most of it is just, as you put it, baked into the cost of goods and services. But doesn't it get replicated over and over again? For example, let's say I make stools. I'm the manufacturer of stools. Well, if I'm going to ship this stool to the, my retail outlet, the shipping company is going to, because it's a business, they mark it up a half percent, right? It, and then when you get it to right. the point of retail, they have an obligation to uh, address the, the excise tax on, on that one stool. So isn't it replicated several times before you actually purchase it? It, it, it is, and we use the term pyramid, pyramiding. Unfortunately, it's, it's actually more complicated than that mm -hmm. in the sense that you know, we have experts for the Hawaii State Tax Review Commission that come in periodically that, that study this, that analyze it, that, that report on its findings. Um, and when you read those studies, what you come away with is a, is a realization that, that this is not simple. For example, you've got to make a distinction between who pays the tax and who bears the burden of the tax. Uh, and with respect to any taxing mechanism, take property taxes, for example. If, if you raise the property tax on, on some um, uh, landlord and uh, their property tax goes up, let's say, $500 that year, so they turn around and, and they increase the, the, rent, the rent, $40 mm -hmm. a month, let's say. Well, $40 a month is $480. They have shifted the burden of that $500 tax increase. They've shifted 480 of that burden to the person who's renting the place. Now, what I've just described isn't earmarked as property tax, but in that example, you can see how the landlord has effectively shifted the burden, burden to the renter. Mm -hmm. So the people who study are Which taxing. Which causes an inflationary effect. Well, that, and you get into this question of, okay, now once we pinpointed where the burden of the tax is, is that regressive or is that progressive or is that somewhere in between? Mm -hmm. And most people, when they talk about a fair tax structure, they're talking about something that is disproportionately burdensome on the rich as opposed to the poor. 
Well, Hawaii's general excise tax system is notorious for being certainly the most regressive tax system in Hawaii, one of the most regressive systems across the United States. And what that means is that on a proportionate basis, based on a person's income, how much ends up directly and indirectly being paid or the burden of it borne mm -hmm. by low-income people, what you find is that the excise tax is the least fair of any possible taxing mechanism. They have smaller incomes, therefore it's a bigger portion of their income. Exactly. And, and, and further complicating all of this, you get into the question of what the experts call exporting. How much of the tax burden can we export? How much of the tax burden can we get non-residents to pay? Mm -hmm. And tourists come to mind right. as a classic example, but it's not just tourists. Well, the mayor has said over and over and over with the excise tax, we get up to a third of that that is exported, paid by, borne by non-residents. Well, the studies indicate that the export rate with property taxes is at least as high. So in other words, that's not a reason for using the excise tax. I am not in favor of raising property taxes to pay for rail. I think that rail is wrong for Hawaii. But the point, and this is really directed to the legislature, mm -hmm. is why in the world would you enable these people who are spending money like crazy on something that's totally out of, out control? of control? Why would you enable that by raising even more taxes with the least fair taxing mechanism available to you when the city, if they really want it, could raise the taxes themselves. They never would because property taxes are too obvious. too obvious. People know what it's costing them. See, that's, mm -hmm. and this, you asked why I got involved in this and why I would spend so much time on this. It outrages me that the city over here is pushing that excise tax and saying this is a wonderful way to raise the tax, et cetera, simply because the bulk of the burden is hidden. It's inherently dishonest. So it's not just unfair, it's dishonest. And that riles me. That's not right. Well, it's, that's, I hate to say it from a Machiavellian point of view, that's where it's genius to have the GET as the funding source for this thing, because no one feels it. Well, they feel it, but they don't know how they feel it. Yeah, that, that's kind of like saying, if I get your wallet into my pocket and the gun that I put to you, the cameras don't see. See that. That's genius. <laughs> no, that's not genius. That's immoral. Immoral genius. <laughs> you know, crim criminal. Yeah. And, and, and that's the other thing. I've stressed that the legislature shouldn't give another penny, especially until there is an audit. People are using the term forensic audit. I, I shy away from that because some people, they hear forensic audit and they think that you're only looking for evidence of a crime. The audit that needs to be done now you know, could find a crime if, if a crime has been committed. But more importantly, we just want to find out why is this thing six years behind schedule? Why is the estimated cost of construction almost double what it was not that long ago? And until the city can give us good answers on that, so far, the first thing they mention as well, the litigation, we've pinpointed what the litigation costs, directly and indirectly, right. as confirmed by Hart. This is something that they had to communicate to, to the FTA. And the point I'm making is the city hasn't begun to explain the bulk of that cost overrun. Right. They haven't begun to Nor explain. Nor do they want to. Nor do they want to. Of course uh, they you don't know, want it's to. It's interesting because when they, you know, the legislature came up with this um, a percentage uh, increase on the tourist accommodation tax, everyone thought, oh, well, that's great. Until, of course, the tourist industry and uh, ex-Mayor Mufi Hanneman, yeah, who's, yeah, yeah. who's the CEO of this organization, said, well, wait, time out. Yeah, yeah, wait yeah. a minute. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's kind of ironic that it kind of ended up in his lap. So, uh, you know, you know. I've, got, I've got a letter here from a, a whistleblower, a, a guy at a high-level position on the rail project up until, you know, right at the end of 2016. And he goes on page after page after page of very specific descriptions of a project that is just out of control. He basically is an engineer, and he talks like an engineer. He gets into the detail. You take a step back, and he's saying, these guys don't know what the hell they're doing. And he said, until you can pinpoint what's gone wrong, expect to have more of what you've had in the past, more overrun, more delays, more screw-ups. Yeah. And, and another whistleblower got a hold of me, and he said, this is a guy who worked for Hart high level. He said, this structure is not going to be safe. He used the word catastrophic. He said, there's going to be a catastrophic, I'm not kidding, there's wow. going to be a catastrophic failure. I said, will you go public? He said, no. Yeah. Okay, he doesn't want 
what would come his direction. He could be the deep throat of heart. This is, this is a guy who had a high level position mm -hmm. and when he used the word catastrophic. That should catch all of our attention. Well, and I'm still working on him. I'm still mm -hmm. working on him to come to come, go public. Yeah, I hope you're successful because we need to hear these stories and it is scary to be a whistleblower because even though you may have some protections by law, a lot of times they just don't work their way into the reality of you being the whistleblower, terminated, ostracized, and, you know, so keep working on it. Let, let me quickly say, whistleblowing is difficult anywhere in an island community. It's devastating. 2,000 miles from any place else, where a lot of these people have very, very deep roots in this community, whistleblowing is a very, very difficult thing to That'll do. Be, so I understand. You won't be working in this town again, as the old saying goes. I want to, we've run out of time, and I, I want to thank you, one, for the motivation that you have. And, and, and keeping up the fight and, and keeping and trying to keep this this project at some level of sanity which is really difficult to do so thank you for your efforts um, thank you for explaining the general excise tax to our viewers because it's complicated and it's not easy to understand so um, please come back again thank you for all your time thank you Tim. and uh, have a great vacation thank you I'm Tim Apicello with Randy Roth this is moving Hawaii forward and we'll see you in a couple weeks Aloha.